Hello, uh, welcome to this talk on the Pre-Cenozoic Lithostratigraphic Units of Sedimentary Geology of Singapore. I'm Tom Dudd, uh, I work for BGS um, on, the, on the BCA contract that looked at the geology of Singapore, which was between 2016 and 2018. I've been stu studying the bedrock of your nation for the last five or so years, and it's been an absolute pleasure to look at your data sets and, and work on your geology. Um, much of the work within this talk um, is, is based upon the published works, which include the uh, Singapore Geology Memoir of 2021, which accompanies the new map, which is just about to be released, or has just been released, depending on the timing of this talk. But also, in the details of the list of stratigraphic um, framework are contained within Dodetel 2019, entitled Paleozoic to Cenozoic Sedimentary Bedrock Geology, and Lithostratigraphy of Singapore, which was published in the Journal of Asian Earth Sciences. For further details, you can uh, look at uh, a slightly more detailed study, which was also published in Jay's, um, entitled Deep to Shallow Marine Sedimentology and the Impact of Volcanism within the Middle Triassic Paleotethian Samantan Basin in Singapore, and that is Dodd et al. 2020, which followed the Without further ado, um, I thought I'd just give you an overview of what this talk's going to look focus on. Um, in this talk, we're going to look at um, a lot of the uh, pre-Cenozoic succession. And by that, I mean these formations and groups within this part of the the uh, stratigraphic model from Dodd et al. 2020, 2019. Tim Kearsey, in another part of the seminar series, um, looked at the... Uh, the criteria to neogene succession to these formations in some detail. So we're not focusing on these today, but we will go over all of these units, groups, formations, members um, in some detail. You can separate the stratigraphy out into some key areas. Um, you've got the Carboniferous stratigraphy at the bottom of the pile, the Triassic Age stratigraphy, which includes the Jurong and Sentosa groups, and very important to the geology of Singapore, Jurassic, and Cretaceous formations above that, um, all separated by both regional and semi-regional conformities. Within this talk we look at the formations in particular and also the members and provide a, a, a rudimentary under, uh, understanding of um, the, uh, the character and composition of each of the formations, specifically diagnostic criteria. We hinge all of that on uh, chronology, so we've got some age dating for the formations. But really, one of the key things to do within within when looking at the bedrock of Singapore is to look at the deposition environments in which these sedimentary formations were deposited. So we go over the um, deposition environments in some detail. And from that, you can begin to um, work out, map, predict, and characterize the composition of your subsurface if you know which formation is underneath your feet, because the uh, the fasci changes, the deep deposits are. Uh, they are very predictable um, and they tend to fall in certain patterns. So if you've got an understanding of the deep position environment, you can um, start to try and um, see and um, predict where you're gonna get certain rock types that may or may not be useful to your building and construction project. So I thought I'd start by um, looking at the, the mapped distribution of uh, the pre cenozoic formations in Singapore. Singapore, well, the pre-Zanozoic formations include 11 formations in total, um, and they are grouped into two groups, the newly formalised Jurong group and Sentosa groups. Um, so the oldest formation in Singapore is the Sajahat formation, which I said on the last slide was Carboniferous in age. There's an unconformity between that and the overlying Jurong group. The Jurong group contains four formations from bottom to top, Two As Formation, Pula Chuan Formation, Pandan Formation, and Boon Lei Formation. Three of those formations also contain members. So within the Pula Chuan Formation, there is the Nanyang member. Within the Pandan Formation, there is the Kent Ridge member. And within the Boon Lei Formation, there is the Clementi member. And those members are discrete units within the formation, they're mappable units but they are, their characteristics are somewhat different from the rest of the formation and therefore they require to be separated as being their own uh, discrete um, set of the stratigraphy. 
correlative to that, or at least kind of contemporaneous to the Boonlay formation, is the Pengarang formation. And the Pengarang formation um, is only found off uh, in this part of the, the map over in this this area over here. And it might be more allied with the geology in Malaysia because you have to consider that Singapore's geology doesn't stop at its coastline and um, geology um, transcends national and international boundaries. And so uh, we have to think about the wider context of the geology of Singapore and how it fits within regional geological models. So it's just something interesting to think about. So most of that part of stratigraphy um, you find um, most of, most of the John group at least you find uh, southwest of this major structure that runs uh, through here um, which Graham Leslie has or will speak about in one of the accompanying seminars as part of this series um, but you see that um, these purple colours in here represent the distribution of the John group above the John group above the John group is a, a unconformity and uh, above that conformity rests the Sentosa group sediments. Now the Sentosa group sediments um, exist in this area towards the southeast of Singapore. Uh, they're composed of two formations, the Tanjong Rimau formation and the Fort Siloso formation. And as a key, as there is a key um, sort of linear in that um, demarks the, uh, the, the point to which you um, stop seeing Sentosa group sediments, and you see Jurong group sediments, so there's some kind of structural control on the lateral distribution of formations and associated facies. Above the Sentosa group is the Buona Vista formation, and the Buona Vista formation is found in a, a few locations, and um, tends to be in these little isolated pockets, usually near to one of these major dash lines in here, which is actually a, a, a thrust, one of the main thrusts in Singapore. So there's some kind of spatial association between the Buena Vista formation and the thrust systems. Finally, the two Cretaceous age formations, sorry, I should have said that the Buena Vista formation is thought to be Jurassic in age. The two Cretaceous formations that follow next, the Kusu formation and Bukit Batok formation, are both separated by uh, unconformities um, and their aging is based on detrital zircon information. But they, they tend to exist in very specific areas in Singapore. The Kusu formation seems to be only found within this polygon in here, whereas the Bukit Batok formation, you find it along main major sort of fault structures, and uh, maybe more extensional fault structures perhaps, following these sorts of lineaments in here and little pockets associated with faulting. I'm going to start by uh, presenting the Sajahat formation. Now the problem with the Sajahat formation is we didn't spend a huge amount of time looking at it at it in outcrop or in core as part of our study and that was largely because we didn't have a lot of core through it. It has been looked at in outcrop and um, Graham Leslie did spend some time looking at the Sajahat formation and it's it's found to be composed of glassy grey siliciclastic rocks with a faintly banded and metamorphosed character. Graham Oliver, another researcher um, in Singapore, not to be confused with Graham Leslie, I spent more time looking at this and uh, and as has published that it's composed of metamorphosed turbiditic sandstones and interbedded mudstones um, it's clearly uh, a formation that's undergone more deformation than the rest of the rocks in Singapore possibly one if not two um, periods of major deformation exist within within the uh, the Sajahat formation and its age dating being Carboniferous in age um, suggests it probably composes the basement onto which the Triassic rocks and or other um, rocks were deposited up on top of. So um, more information about the Sajahat formation can be found in uh, Graham Oliver's work. Uh, we do know that because of the time timing issues between these rocks being Carboniferous in age and the um, sedimentary rocks of the drone group being Triassic in age, there must be a large uh, pervasive unconformity at the top of the Sajahat formation. And that major unconformity marks the uh, beginning of the Jurong group. So the Jurong group is one of the new major groups within Singapore. Uh, it's going to be really important 
especially in the uh, south uh, western areas of Singapore in terms of building and construction properties of the subsurface. The first formation of the Duong group is the Tuas formation. Uh, the Tuas formation uh, sits just above the unconformity of the Sajahat formation uh, and it is a, a largely a, a carbonate and a silicoclastic uh, mixed lithology uh, formation. The, the, those carbonates and silicoclastic rocks uh, typically form in um, cyclic successions of up to 10 to 15 metres in scale for each package. Uh, the carbonate units typically are 1 to 20 metres thick. Uh, they uh, commonly uh, have uh, subordinate amounts of mudstone within them, um, uh, which forms irregular patches uh, within within the matrix that typically feature uh, alichems. And by alichems, I mean uh, things like oncoids and peloids, uh, nice features that you can actually spot within the, the carbonate, which is otherwise seems to be quite homogeneous. So these are, these are those alichems in here, these, these dark features within this sort of lighter grey matrix. There are also silicoclastic units in there. Um, and they, they can be quite thick, up to 20 metres in thickness. Uh, and you can see some examples of those just in here, this, this, this sandstone in, in, in this section in here. Occasionally, well not, the, uh, the unit has uh, tufts and tuffites, but on balance from the examples, we think it's rare, really. Um, and, and what do those tough fights look like? Oh, there's an example of one of the tough fights. It's got that much more green coloration to it than, than what is seen in the more siliciclastic dominated sands, perhaps example shown in here. The overall environment of deposition for the 2S formation is interpreted as a, a carbonate lagoon, um, perhaps with fringing siliciclastic systems such as in draining deltas or even re-entrant deltas if we're within a, a bay or enclosed um, area. The carbonates are formed within the, in the shallow waters with the, the fringing siliciclastics next to them and they, that's how they interfinger and produce this cyclic succession which may or may not be controlled by uh, changes in relative sea level over time. The occasional presence of Tufts and tuffites suggest that there is a nearby volcanic arc somewhere, but perhaps it's very distal or inactive at this present moment in time. Above the Tuas formation, we have the Pula Ayatran formation. The Pula Ayatran formation, we think, sits pretty much conformably on the Tuas formation and is composed of largely siliciclastic sandstones and mudstones. They form an interbedded, interlayered succession of cleaner sands, uh, more muddy units, and even some more debritic units in here, shown by that stick. Uh, the sand grains that you see within the quarter grain units typically subangular to subrounded, so a range of maturity. They can contain intraformational mud class, which are quite common. Um, so, uh, mud that's been ripped up from the substrate and deposited within the sand. The layers of mudstone that you see are typically dark grey to black, they're laminated, they're siliciclastic, and they really do reflect hemiplegic deposition in the background environment. The conglomerates, however, uh, are quite different. They have quite a mixed class assemblage of carbonate rock, granitic rock, rock and uh, mudstones. Those, uh, those car uh, conglomerates that are shown in these, these images in here, quite char charismatic facies. Occasionally you have reworked volcanogenic material, so tufts and tuffites, um, which in some places can be quite common as well. Within the Pulara Juan formation there is the Nanyang member. Now I said that the, the tufts and tuffites are, are occasional or common sometimes in the in the wider Pulara Juan formation, but there is actually a volcanic or volcanic clastic dominated uh, member within its own right, so a, a mappable unit within the Pula Aachuan formation. And that member, the Nanyang member, looks like this. These textures are quite different to the rest of the Pula Aachuan formation, even those conglomerates that we saw um, are very different in, in overall texture composition. The rock is, is uh, dominated by clasts of andesitic rock, 
Um, so they're igneous rock clasts, which typically have polygonal shapes and they're concentrically zoned in character. So when you see them, they have these dark green rims and paler cores, just like in here. And they form these polygonal structures that almost looks like they've just been broken apart in, in situ where they are. The pyroclastic rocks are thought to have erupted um, either sub or sub and where the, the current models are leaning towards sub eruptions. And that on that basis, that's based on um, how the texture of these have formed, they've been rapidly quenched, so eruptions directly into cold seawater of magma cause the rocks to almost instantaneously freeze and then contract and fracture, forming these, these polygonal features. The mudstones that you see within this unit um, are likely ripped up uh, from the sea floor and trained within the, the eruption event and brought in and deposited along with the, the hydrofractured um, fragments that are, dominate the Nanyang member. But there is a range of facies, so that's I'm really talking about the coarser element of the, the, the Nanyang member. It does go to finer grain sizes through to even fine satin grain, even to mudstones. We think that reflects a sort of a proximal to distal um, facies transition from the centre of the eruption to the extremities of the eruption. So bringing that in mind, the Pula Air Tram Formation and the Nanyang member, what does it look like? Well, we think something like this. So a, a, a deep water deposition environment, perhaps with turbidite fans coming into the basin. Next to those turbidite fans would be just normal background hemipelagic deposition, so that would have formed the mudstones with the turbidite fans comprised of more thickly bedded um, sandstones. Those sandstones within the turbidite fan do range in Fassi's character, so you have these thickly bedded ones in here, more thinly bedded ones towards the edges of the fan. And so you see lateral and distal <coughs> changes in fasces within, within, the, within the formation. Then we have Something that happens in the hinterland, you see a change in the, the, the sedimentary deposits in the depot center, the inbring of a lot of tufts and tough heights into the basin forming um, uh, volcanically dominated turbidite fans and also some pyroclastic density currents, so PDC deposits um, uh, within the basin, so primary eruptions flowing into the basin subsea and depositing directly in the, in the, in the basin center um, below the water. So an increase in activity. Along with that comes the debrites, the mixed class assemblages of the debrites just in here with carbonate fragments and granitic clasts. And we think that's reflective of a, a shelf that's been destabilized, possibly a shelf composed of two-ass formation, which might explain where the carbonates have come from. And, and those, those would be related to slope collapse events, which then eventually transformed into debris flows in the basin center, all linked to increases in volcanic activity in the hinterland in the nearby arc. And then that culminated in the eruption of the uh, Nanyang member deposits. So the, the, these formed um, those quench textures that I was talking about, which also referred to as hyaloclastites. And those hyaloclastites may have formed in uh, mounds or ridges, depending on the geometry and orientation of the, the eruption vents. But they would have formed on the base at the bottom of the seafloor and are interbedded or laterally equivalent to other deposits within the, the wider Pula Aachuan formation within the deep water environment. There's lots more information on this um, within those published works that I referred to at the start of the talk, but more specifically within Dodd et al 2020. Um, so you can find out lots more of information about that really interesting story in that. Moving on, we think there is a minor unconformity between the top of the Pula Aachuan formation um, and the overlying Pandan formation, which I'm about to talk to you about, about you next. The Pandan formation. Pandan formation is a largely a, a carbonate dominated formation. It's thickly bedded, homogeneous micritic limestones in general, and those intervals can be up between 5 and 50 meters in thickness, so really thick limestones. These limestones generally lack uh, at the allochems, so things like peloids and oncoids, you don't tend to see them as much, whether that's preservation or whether they never formed in the first place an interesting research avenue to follow. Occasionally you have thinly and thickly bedded layers of tuff and tuffite within the Pandan formation. 
and even more rare interbedded layers of sandstone and mudstones. So occasionally you get some siliciclastic sediment being brought into the environment, but um, that very quickly gets um, re-dominated by the carbonate deposition. Key features of the, those carbonates are these black um, sort of sinuous features that run throughout the core, and these could be reflective of either some form of um, pressure dissolution um, feature, or they may be a, a relic uh, nodular bedding that you form within carbonates, or both. This is just another example with in, in a bit more of a close-up of, of the general character of the Pandan formation. And there are some rare examples where you see some more, some alicams, some shelly fragments, and this is a cut through one of a, a sort of bivalve shell. shell. There is some of that, but it's not to the same extent uh, or quality or visual character as you see within the carbonates within the 2S formation. I mentioned that tuff was, you see it rarely sort of metre scale tuffs or sub metre scale tuffs within the Pandan formation, but actually there is a whole member within its own right that is composed of largely tuff and tuffites. Um, which is a mappable unit within its own right, and that is known as the Kent Ridge member. Uh, these rocks consist of largely the pilly tuffs um, with significant proportions of fiamme, some lithic fragments and crystals in an ash grade matrix, so they're all set within that, that matrix. Most of the fiamme are green, sort of 50 millimetres long, and tend to be flattened and aligned, so that, that flattening and alignment can be sort of seen in this example here. Most lithic clasps are less than 30 millimetres in size and formed of porphyritic volcanic rock. Um, and there are also entrained crystals of up to four millimetres in diameter, composing of quartz and feldspar. So it really is a volcanic dominated part of, the, uh, of, the, of that formation and of the Kent Ridge member. Deposition environment, well, how do we look at the Pandan formation and Kent Ridge member? Well, we think it was a low energy carbonate lagoonal sort of setting. Um, we think that there was low volumes of clastic input into the system, so you had quite continued and persistent carbonate production in a really low energy setting, which is why you mainly got micritic muds. To preserve that, you might have had um, generation of accommodation space in the basin, which allowed you to deposit and basically build up such a thick succession. The, the, the tufts and tuffites of the Cambridge member are easy to reconcile in that uh, they, may, they, they likely reflect volcanic eruptions in the hinterland, uh, which then flowed out into the, into the basin centre and form these thick tufts in the, in the carbonate lagoonal setting. They're pretty immediate, so you have carbonate production, then you tuff, and then it back to carbonate production, so it's, it is a, a isolated event or relatively isolated set of events temporarily that formed that, that Kent Ridge member um, along the basin during this time. The overlying Boone Lane formation, which represents the upper part of the uh, middle Triassic Jurong group, uh, is quite a mixed formation. It is sandstone dominant, um, and those sandstones are typically laminated, very fine to medium grained and clay rich. Uh, they have common mud drapes on sedimentary structures in the sandstones that forms something known as flaser lamination and that flaser lamination is often a, a, an indicator for varied sedimentary processes uh, a higher energy event followed by a lower energy event a higher energy event followed by a lower energy event and that can be used to infer tidal influences on sedimentation the sandstone package is commonly coarsened upwards and have interbedded thin layers of mudstone uh, thin uh, so when I say thin, between one to three metre thick units of mucritic limestone can develop, and those tend to develop in the lower part of the Boonlay formation, perhaps signifying a transitional boundary between that and the, um, the older Pandan formation below. The, uh, the overall character said it was a mixed bag, it really is. These are some examples of what you find within the Boonlay formation. These are these sandstone dominated um, successions with these um, lamp parallel laminations of, with composed of mud drapes, um, they're quite thinly interbedded. Those coursing upward successions and flazer bedding suggest perhaps marginal marine processes going on. But at the same time, you find areas of a core where you see this mottling, almost a pedogenic texture forming in here. So soil or, or proto soil development, perhaps. 
So quite shallow waters in some areas, if that's the case. Uh, this is showing the influence of um, tufts within the, within the succession. You do sometimes see volcanogenic material being brought into the Boonlay formation, but it tends to be less dominant than all of the formations that preceded the Boonlay formation. The sediments can be pretty poorly sorted, pretty immature, pretty mud rich. Um, they can be more moderately sorted or quite well sorted. So it is a mixture of things and that is really indicative of a marginal marine setting where you have interplay between the terrestrial fluvial, usually fluvial dominated processes, sometimes alluvial, and the marine dominated um, shallow water processes. And as sea level varies, you get this mixed um, system. The Boonlay Formation has one key member, the Clementi member. The Clementi member uh, basically is all of the really quite shallow water versions of the Boonlay Formation. Uh, it's a mappable unit within its own right. And it consists mainly of reddened, so red, reddened in this example is really useful to identify the Clementi member. Um, it's reddened paleosols, and those are, those are thought to be andosols and altisols, so um, volcanic um, soils that have formed paleosols and also waterlogged soils. And these tend to form beds between 5 and 20 metres in thickness and they're interbedded um, with unreddened fine to medium grain sandstones. So you have some plastic material being brought into these settings along with the, the, the reddened volcanic landscapes. The reddened paleosols are also found in the Boulay formation, Fort Siloso formation and the Bucket Patak formation. So the red paleosol does not necessarily equal Clementi member. It needs to be thought about in context. Um, so uh, just something to be aware of. The alteration associated, associated with paleosol development produce strong colours. And those strong colours are diagnostic of um, alteration of paleosols. In terms of the months or colour system, the colours range from weak red, reddish brown, reddish grey, coarse grain sedimentary rocks. Uh, so we're talking about conglomerates really, um, or very, very coarse uh, sandstones, genuinely are absent from this member. The Pengarang formation, uh, we've put it within the stratigraphy next to the Boonlay formation because lots of reasons why and that's within the, um, the memoir. We can go and read more about that in there. But we think it's largely correlative with the Boonlay formation. And that's because it's largely dominated by pyroclastic rocks. The pilly tufts and tufts that has embedded rock fragments um, 50 millimetres in diameter. Um, so it's generally suggesting it's a lapilli tuff dominated formation. Um, and it's andesitic in, in, in origin in some parts with andesitic fragments being set in a ground mass of irregular felspar lathes, glass and opaque ore. So that's, that's a quote taken from DSTA 2009, which you can go read more about. And we haven't done a lot of work on the Pengrang formation within our study, but using that as a description and comparing it to the descriptions of the Boonlay and certainly the Clementi member of the Boonlay formation, it makes most sense that these are correlative. The overall environment for the Boonlay formation, uh, we think, as I was saying, it's a marginal marine setting. Um, I think mainly what in Singapore, perhaps sort of this marginal area that fringes fringes is probably the most um, accurate parts of the Boonlay formation that you have within your bedrock uh, in Singapore. You have these perhaps marginal marine systems bringing in fluvial um, material into the into the deeper centre, marginal marine lagoons, even shallow marine um, successions fringing deltas. Perhaps there's um, more distal equivalents to the Boonlay formation to be found elsewhere outside of Singapore, it would make sense that any marginal marine system drains into a deeper water system um, that's temporarily associated with. And then the volcanic plastic um, uh, part of the system uh, represented by the Clementi member, so a volcanic landscape with eruptions and then pedogenesis forming andesols and more waterlogged areas, perhaps um, in other long strike locations forming altisols. Um, but quite a long-standing um, set of processes that open over thousands and thousands of years to form those types of soils. So uh, um, when we think about uh, 
the Duong group in context, where was it formed? We think it was formed within a basin depot center just in here, um, which is somewhere between uh, the Paleotethys Ocean out towards perhaps the uh, uh, modern day south west and uh, the Sukhothai Arc, um, which forms much of the um, the bedrock geology, such as the Bucket Tima Centre in, in Singapore. And we think that uh, this, this basin deeper centre was the location of the Pula Aratran Formation and the Pandan Formations. Uh, perhaps the two as well was deposited in the in the basin centre in here, but certainly during Pula Aratran Formations and Pandan Formation times, it was receiving a lot of volcanic plastic material from the Sukhothai Arc, which was likely active during that time. We see the, the turbidite dominated sandstones, the debris flows from a, an unstable um, shelf edge, and uh, so quite an active setting. And as we progress through time, um, Sibamas, who's sort of on its way towards the Sukhothai Arc, ready to collide with it, the, uh, the Paleotethys is shortened, there's a subducting slab going underneath here. We think during this time, perhaps the arc was less active and that um, enabled the unroofing of the, uh, the erosion of the Bucket Timo center forming um, the Boone Lay formation perhaps, um, and then certainly the ensuing formations of groups um, later on in the talk. But the, the key thing to notice is that we go from um, deeper water or shallow marine settings in the in the first three formations of the Jurong group. And then by the time we get to the Boone layer in that marginal marine setting, perhaps Fassi's belts are shifting um, towards the basin centre as the basin centre area becomes restricted and the accommodation space um, ceases to be developed or is reduced because of um, compressional tectonics going on. So um, following the Boone layer formation, there's a major unconformity that separates the uh, Jurong group from the Sentosa group. Sentosa group uh, is the other newly uh, recognised group within Singapore. It's composed of two formations, and those formations are the Tanjong Rimo formation and the overlying Fort Siloso formation, so just in here. We're going to focus on first on the Tanjong Rimo formation. Um, the Tanjong Rimo formation is characterised by quite coarse grained, very immature, poorly sorted angular to subangular quartz rich sandstones and one to four millimeter sorry one to four meter thick mudstones which are thinly interbedded with very fine to medium grained well sorted sandstones Con there's also conglomerates those conglomerates have a uh, distinctive clast assemblage a composed of white vein quartz volcanic rocks extra formational siliciclastic rocks and metamorphic rocks importantly they lack rounded cobble to boulder grade clasts that we think are indicative of a uh, another formation within Singapore which is much younger. This is what it kind of looks like in core um, and here's some examples in outcrop from Pula Tukukor and, and uh, Siloza, Fort Siloza. And uh, you can see that the, the character in core and outcrop is pretty nice, it's pretty, uh, you see the same features in both core and outcrop, it's pretty indicative of the formation and, and it really is these immature sediments that you can see in here, These this immature class supported conglomerate. Some parts of it are better sorted so you do get very well sorted sands in there as well and occasional quite white um, highly altered or weathered mudstones in between the coarser grained deposits. We think the Tanjong Rimo formation, those coarse grained deposits were formed and deposited within a fluvial system and that fluvial system was braided to meandering in that we had fluvial channels um, carving um, their way through uh, next to those fluvial channels in some places you have um, point bars or attached bars um, forming uh, a, a characteristic uh, meandering type deposit in other areas you don't you tend to have in channel bars um, uh, and more more channel dominated deposition and perhaps more reflecting a more of a braided system so it really is a mixture of two different fluvial systems and um, that form this, this unit. Next to the fluvial channels you have spanning bodies of water where those mudstones may have formed that we, we see in between in between the channel systems. And in some places, um, like on Jung Island for example, you see um, more alluvial dominated deposits. So there's 
there's a CIVI deposits on, on Jong and uh, that might reflect um, marginal or edge alluvial fan systems that are draining into the basin. Above the Tanjong Rimmo formation we have the Fort Siloso formation and it, in general if you're going to compare the two formations the Fort Siloso formation is much finer grained. It's composed dominantly of clay to silk grade silicic clastic mudstones interbedded with very fine to fine grained very well sorted very mature sandstones. And the sandstones throughout whenever you see them within the Fort Siloso they tend to be subangular grained but very very well sorted. So thinking of a, uh, a low energy setting with um, low energy channels coming in perhaps. What did it look like in core? This is pretty indicative of it in core. You see these dark mudstones, these dark red mudstones with these phaser laminations in here. These are these are phaser laminated ripples in here. Um, and then you occasionally have uh, slightly coarser grain, maybe um, very fine grain sand, to fine grain sand cross bedded units in here. And um, the cross bedding tends to be quite thin. And um, they, they form as these sort of channel lenses. So if you follow my cursor, this is actually the base of the channel just in here. It kind of comes up here and has a feathered edge. And that's in filled with those thin bedded, cross bedded sands to phaser ripple laminated sands. If you want to see what those sort of ripples look like, um, other types of ripples do exist as well. Um, so in here you have these, these um, current ripples, um, but Largely, it is phaser laminated, and then you see some burrowing as well on on some of these horizons. So these lovely little burrows in here, which are from that that horizon just in there where that B is. So it's uh, it really has a uh, quite a low energy sort of quiet sort of environment sort of feel to it. And the Fort Siloso formation, we think, um, is basically what was deposited after a marine incursion event. So the, the fluvial system of the Tanjong Rimo formation was um, uh, basically flooded. You, by doing that, you, you shut off a lot of the, the sourcing systems to the fluvial systems in the hinterland. And you bring in this marginal, marine dominated, low energy setting. We see the evidence of phaser lamination. So um, indicating you've got some tidal um, energy going on on some of the islands, you actually see evidence for herringbone cross stratification, um, and in other areas, um, hummocky cross stratification. So that they're both um, reflective of wave energy. Uh, the former reflecting more sort of a higher energy event one way, and a lower energy event another way, forming sands and muds. The herringbone cross stratification indicating tidal processes, and the hummocky cross stratification indicating storm energy, higher energy events forming these hummocks and swales that you get um, below fair weather wave base. So it really does paint the picture that you've got a marine transgression going on in the Fort Siloso formation. Following the Fort Siloso formation there's a major unconformity um, and that major unconformity uh, likely relates to the final docking of Sibumasu with uh, the Sukhothai arc. And one of those products of that final docking is the Buena Vista Formation. The Buena Vista Formation is dominated by conglomerates of a rounded cobble grade clast um, assemblage. These beds are distinctive and lack the clast assemblage that we saw within the Tanjong Rimo Formation. Um, uh, so they don't have any of the white vein quartz, volcanic rocks, extra formation or silicic clastic rocks metamorphic rocks that characterize the Tanjung Rimo formation. It tends to be a really mixed bag of class mythologies from um, uh, extra formational clastic material through to um, some uh, lith well, some older volcanic material in there as well, some granitic material, all sorts of things. So it's not as not as a conspicuous clastic assemblage that you see in the Tanjung Rimo. And they're rounded, they tend to be more rounded, um, might be reflecting slightly different sedimentary processes that uh, deposited these these units. In terms of time, um, the, we think that the Buena Vista formation is Jurassic in age, so everything else we've been talking about before, this, not including the Sajahat formation, everything within the Jurong and Sentosa groups is, we think and we have data to be Jurassic in age. But 
the Buena Vista formation, um, yeah, being Jurassic in age and uh, associated, likely associated with the docking of Sibo Massu, provides some kind of age constraint on when the two terrains came together and formed this this unit. Because of that, we think that the Buena Vista formation uh, represents um, some kind of um, synorogenic conglomerate. It was likely deposited in by in and by alluvial fans and alluvial processes that perhaps fringed um, the uh, the uh, developing thrust system. Some of the Buena Vista may have fluvial processes occurring, and that, that might have just be some form of axial system, perhaps also fed by uh, fluvial systems dissecting the uh, developing thrust system and basically sourcing a whole range of class lithologies, a mixture of class lithologies that cuts down through the various thrusts um, into the fluvial systems and into the alluvial fans. Following the collision, the, the, the deposition and preservation of the synorogenic Buena Vista formation, we think there's another major unconformity and that's largely based on an age difference between the early deposits and the overlying uh, age of the overlying Kusu formation, which we're about to look at in a minute. But also, you can spot this unconformity outcrop. Um, so there's an example of that, that conform unconformity with these steeply dipping beds in here, overlain by this, this, um, this horizon in here, and deposited on top of that horizon or that unconformity, you have the Kusu formation um, with the beds dipping much more shallowly compared with the, the Tanjong Rim formation below. So this we think is one of these key unconformities in Singapore. The Kusu formation, as I said, we thought it was younger. Uh, we, we think it's uh, Cretaceous in age and that's based on some geochronology which is within the explained within the Dodd et al. 2019 paper and within the memoir. Um, the Kusu formation is quartz rich, thickly bedded. Um, and composed largely of sandstones, um, and those sandstones are very well rounded, medium to coarse grained, um, quartz rich, and um, you can see well developed quartz overgrowths. The rock lacks the recrystallization and penetrative fabric that would be associated with deformation and metamorphism, and um, so uh, that that suggests that these well it sort of supports also that these are probably younger deposits in that they haven't gone through the same kind of collisional tectonics that the Triassic has when Sibamasu collided into the Sukhothai arc and instead it's much younger and less deformed. We think the Kuzu formation um, was deposited in perhaps uh, by fluvial processes. Um, above the Kuzu formation um, there's uh, another minor unconformity um, and that unconformity is interpreted largely on the basis of age dating of the following formation, the Bukit Batok formation. So the Bukit Batok formation, um, we think is quite a bit younger than the Kusu formation. We think it's Aptian in age, whereas the Kusu formation is probably Beriasian in age. That's based on um, geochronological um, detrital zircon dating um, as described in Dodetel 2019. Like the Kuzu formation, these sands are um, less deformed um, and less metamorphosed. You can see the sand grains really clearly. Um, the sandstones themselves are fine to medium grained, well to very well sorted, um, and they're interbedded with common examples of mudstones. And those mudstones are really dark grey to black in character. They probably are or were at some point in time organic rich. Um, and you see lots of evidence for um, soft sediment deformation, particularly at the base of the sandstone units when they load into those dark grey mudstones. The rock lacks, as I said before, the, the, the rock lacks that recrystallization and penetrative fabric. And so you can be pretty sure that these sediments haven't been through the same deformation event that the, the older Jurassic and Triassic formations in Singapore have. They look very different in character when you compare images of these two formations. And overall, I said the Kusu formation was deposited by fluvial processes. We've seen more examples of the Bukit Patok formation in core and outcrop, and we could be more confident that uh, the Bukit Patok formation is fluvial dominated, perhaps fluvial deltaic. Um, so, and the, the fluvial deltaics uh, will have 
flowed out towards a, into a, a basin depot centre. So that may or may not have been located to the northwest. That's pie in the sky kind of interpretation here. But that just sort of gives an, an idea that it's flowing somewhere. We think the it's a relatively mature fluvial system because of those well sorted sands, quite a large fluvial system. Um, with standing bodies of water on the floodplain next to the channels, forming those dark grey mudstones, those organic rich mudstones perhaps in standing bodies of water that may have may be formed by as oxbow lakes if it, the system was meandering. Um, we don't need know enough about it to be able to say one way or another, but perhaps an area of research. But one key thing about the bucket patok formation is that I, in early slides I, I said that the bucket patok formation was a constraint to linear belts usually following major structures and perhaps that um, reflects those the, the the influence of those major structures to control where those fluvial systems flowed so maybe they were fault bound that's one possibility the other possibility is that the fluvial system is everywhere and it's just that those faults preserve a bit of the younger stratigraphy which has otherwise been eroded off something to be explored in the future so that was the pre-Cenozoic lithostratigraphic framework for Singapore. We looked at 11 formations, three members, and those formations have been grouped into two groups, the uh, Jurong group and Sintosa group. Each formation is a specific set of diagnostic criteria which you can find within DOD et al 2019 and the memoir, as well as many variations within that formation as well. So look for the diagnostic criteria and then note anything else because there might be extra things we don't know about that formation that need to be recorded and built into the diagnostic criteria in the future. The sedimentary environments of deposition fundamentally control the preserved rock record. That's true for any, any sedimentary environment. The sedimentary processes within that environment will either deposit sand or mud or mixtures or carbonate. So um, you can use that and you can use an understanding of those processes to predict where and what kind of rock types you'll find in the subsurface, which is really useful because if you build up an understanding of the, for example, the 2S formation, you can start to predict where the turbulite fans are going to be and where the background muds are going to be. In the Pandan formation, you can use it to think about where the carbonate lagoon is, where the eruption center for the Kent Ridge tuff might be, and use that to um, predict what's going on in the subsurface. The key thing is that the, the, this stratigraphic framework is supported by geochronological data as well. So whilst we look for lithology and we look for lithological information to discern the mappable units, we also support it by taking samples for, for example, detrital zircon analysis and also eruptive tuff analysis to support and back up the aging of the stratigraphy, the age of the rocks that we're looking at. And on top of that, you use other evidence such as uh, structural observations like looking for cleavages, looking for evidence of deformation and the metamorphism of sediments that can maybe suggest to you that we've got older or certainly more deformed rocks or younger and less deformed rocks. And with that, two key references in here um, and also the memoir that is also just about to be published as well. Thank you for listening.